on the other, you know, plane and going, okay, well, this is going on and this is getting out of control because I'm not in the moment. But when we're playing and with tennis, we're in the moment, and so therefore we can't see things. And a great example of this was um, uh, Sanchez came up here and he was actually doing a doing a coaching seminar up in the, he was the Davis Cup coach for Spain. And he was talking to us about when he got the chance to, to meet Rafael Nadal and Nadal got to be on the Davis Cup team for Spain. He's a pretty humble guy and so he, he went up to Nadal and said, hey listen, you know, you're the number one player in the world. I don't want to step on anybody's toes. Your, your Uncle Tony is one of the greatest coaches ever. So when I'm sitting on the bench, you know, do you want me just to kind of clap? Do you want me to say anything? You, me, you know, he was really looking for Nadal to tell him what he wanted. He's like, look, I'm not going to mess you up. I'm pretty sure you understand how to play this sport, so I'll just sit here and clap if you want. And Nadal said, no, no, I want you to tell me what's going on. Okay, your eyes and your ears have no emotion to it. When I'm playing, I play with so much emotion, I can't see what's going on. I want your, and I value your opinion. And that's from someone that's number one in the world, Okay, won multiple Grand Slams, and he's able to understand that when we're in the moment and we're playing, it's very difficult for us to step back and see what's going on. So that makes it very difficult for our lessons, who are not Grand Slam champions, to step back and see what's going on and understand it. That's the first thing. The second thing is, obviously, there's no coaching during the match. So we can't run out there, we can't call timeout, we can't kind of grab a hold of our students and say, hey, it's sliding. The match is sliding. It's moving away. So let's slow down. Let's calm down. Okay, we can't do that. Unlike you know every other sport. Okay, there's also limited breaks. Our breaks are not very long, 90 seconds at changeovers. Okay, so the player doesn't have a lot of time to regroup. All right, and every time they want to really slow it down, and they have to use the restroom. They almost get booed off the court at the elite level. Right? It's, it's kind of like bad protocol. So it's very, very difficult to really stall it or get that get our opponent to calm down, or our player, excuse me, to calm down. Um, the other one is, is that when we talk about momentum, we're talking about a match. And when we go through this, there's only, not that every point is, is worthless, but there are critical points. And we all know this, so there are major points. And they only come up a handful of times in a match. So therefore, it's very difficult for our lessons Okay, when they're playing to get out there and and run that opportunity, you know, play that out over and over again, unless they're playing a tremendous amount of matches. So that's a lot of hours on the court for a very small window of time for them to understand and grasp momentum. So it's very, very difficult. So those are the three main reasons why this is very difficult for them to understand and to play. Um, but if we can really harness this, the power of this is that it will affect all of your clients, every one of them, from the 3 0 lady that's playing in USGA leagues to if you have professional players. Okay, you can work with them and this will register with all of them. And it doesn't necessarily have to be on the court. Okay, so you know, uh, we're very fortunate here at the Rack Club, we have indoor courts, so we get to go non stop. But not everybody has that luxury. If it rains, we're out for the day. So being able to bring in that lesson and say, listen, instead of Canceling, let's come in and let's go over this. Let's talk about momentum. Let's talk about matches. We do this a lot with our juniors, and we've had tremendous success. So obviously with the tournament, we don't have access to all the indoor courts for our junior program, so we will bring them in in February, and we'll actually char matches. We'll actually talk about momentum and let them see it with the pros, and it's very, very helpful for them. So again, it's another way to reach out to all levels of lessons. So it's a great, it's not like, Okay, I'm going to teach you a forehand that's specific to a, you know, an elite player or a beginner. This can impact everybody and make you a much better coach. In saying that, we go to the sheet that I, that uh, I believe Pat gave everybody. There are five different types of momentum. Okay, um, absolute positive, positive, neutral, negative, and absolute negative. I didn't really branch out and give a lot of, you know. Big names to it. I think they're very self-explanatory. Okay, I just like to touch on probably what they feel like because it's best to communicate to your lessons what what they're feeling. Okay, so we talk about absolute positive. That's in the zone. That's where your lesson is going to tell you they feel like the tennis ball is the size of a beach volleyball. You know, they just they can't miss. 
they're feeling really good, everything just seems to be clicking. It also means that you're, a lot of times the opponent's playing right into that. They're playing into the strengths of your, your player. Okay, they're playing quick. Things are going going well. They're making probably a lot of errors. Okay, so you're, you're, the players feel really good about how everything's painting out, and obviously they're winning most of the points. Then we talk about positive in itself, and that's where you're, you're, you're ahead, you're in control, but it's not quite as, as, as easy. It's not coming to them as easy. They're having to work for it, okay? But the opponent's making errors at the, at the right time, or the player's making some big shots at the right time, and so things are going well. Then we talk about neutral, and this is what we always call about the battle. This is where it goes back and forth. Last night's match, okay, was, was nonstop. It was just back and forth, okay? Player would win three points, go 40 love, the other one would come back, okay, vice versa. Numerous break points saved, and no one ever really took control for the first two sets of that match. It was just back and forth, back and forth, okay? And you could feel it, and the players, you could sense the players feeling it, and so therefore they played accordingly. No one really branched out from their game plan, okay? I don't think Karlovich hit a, hit a top from backhand until the third set, okay, because he just was that nervous. He felt that pressure. He never felt like he could get game total control, so he's in a neutral state, okay? So as a coach, all right, afterwards, after the match, the coach is going, you've got to be able to step out of your comfort zone, and these are the matches you've got to come over the back, and he's standing there talking about it, okay? So these players know it, but it's that strong that even the best still still fall into that trap. So that was what I call neutral. Then we go to negative, and that's where you're, it's a flip of the positive, obviously, but your, your players in the match, they just don't seem to be winning. They're winning points, but they don't seem to be winning games. They're never quite ahead. Okay, It's just like you're, you're there, you're competing, but you just can't seem to go over the hurdle. Okay, and then we talk about absolute negative, and then that's that's the, the one we worry about the most as coaches. Okay, players spinning out of control, they're feeding it to their opponent. Okay, whether it be they're playing too fast, they're playing the wrong game plan, they're doing a lot of different things. Okay, and they're not seeing it. That's probably the worst part about it. The player doesn't even realize. And we've all talked to people where they come off the court, they've lost one and one, and you say, well, what happened? And they're like, I really don't know. I just don't know. All right, they've lost the plot, they've lost control of the match, and this is where we talk about absolute negative. This happens more, more so at the lower levels than at the elite level. The elite level have, have a way to harness that and stop it from getting there. It does happen. You can see it if you come to the qualifying here. You saw it when you had, we had some of the Memphis players that actually got into qualies, playing the pros that have been on the tour, okay? And you could see that that, that took place. And these, the college players weren't bad players. I mean, they're still, most of them are ranked top 100 in the country. Okay, so they're not bad players, but you could see the level difference, okay? You could see that absolute negative taking place. And you could also see their coach going nuts, going, oh my goodness, these guys are trained, we train, we train, and they don't seem to get it. Okay, in saying that, there are ways to harness this. We obviously want our lessons and our clients to be in the positive, so how do we get them there? How can we coach them? How can we give them something tangible? Okay, and that's where we talk about, I break it down. There are two different ways in which we call you can shift momentum. There are two types of momentum shifters, okay? And then we'll get back to how we can control it. The first one is on critical score counts. There are certain times that are just bigger points, okay? All right, we want, every point is important, but there are just times that they're bigger, okay? In the case, I'll, I'll keep referring back to what's going on here. You're seeing it, the Bryan Twins. Okay, probably the best big point players I've ever seen. Okay, when the big point comes, they play better. Not the same, they play better. They know it, they understand it, and they actually, you know, especially in doubles with the new format, no ad scoring, super tiebreakers for third, those points, there's some major, major swing points. Okay, they understand it and they play better. Okay, they make their living off of it, and they're obviously the best that probably has ever played. Okay, even at work, uh, according to the coach uh, Mark Woodford. So, um, so, so it's 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 uh, very big, and these swing points are going to happen. And this is with ad scoring. I need to remind you, with ad scoring, with no ad scoring, the one big point that stands out more than anything else is fifteen thirty. So, that's just a side note. I just went off an ad, but if you're playing no ad, fifteen thirty is the biggest point, and here's why: you win that point. 
that person now has three chances to win that game. 15-30 is huge. It's so, because it's kind of in the middle, one person's won one point, it's so overlooked, it's massive. You win that point, you've got three chances, you lose that point, it's 30 all. Major, major difference. So it's something that you can also pass along, especially if you coach high school tennis and you go to NOAD here in the state of Tennessee. We do NOAD, okay? It's something we really preach with the kids when they play competitively on that, um, on that front. Um, but the other game, the other points are, I believe the first point, anything with the 30, okay? Closing out the set and match points, okay? Those are big ones uh, in there. First point is big, that sets the tone for the game, okay? And again, last night's match was, was, was huge with that, in that you could see the tempo of the game. If the player serving won the first point, it was almost to love the rest of the game. If they lost the first point, although it wasn't necessarily a break, it usually went to deuce, almost every single time. Okay, So it's a very, very big point. Players feel confident, especially when you teach closing out sequences. All of our juniors have closeout patterns that we make them do. The first point is the critical one in closing out a match. It's huge. They get the confidence, they feel like they feel good, and they feel like they can close out the rest of the match. Huge point. Nobody really emphasizes. Obviously, we touched on 15-30, 30-15. Even, no, even an ad, it still gives you two opportunities to close out, so it's a very, very big point. Because it's midway through the game, people overlook this point a lot. Okay, You'll see a lot of times people at 30-15, and this is where I see a lot of drop shots, a lot of hack shots, a lot of maybe crazy shots because they walk up in this game, you know, score count, and I don't believe in that. I think you 30 point, you want to take that, you want to run your best stuff. Then if you have a large lead of 40 love, 40, 15 lead, then maybe you can try something that will throw your opponent off. But even with that as a drop shot or things like that, that should be by design, okay, should be built in to probably give some variety, let your opponent know, hey, I can't hit these shots, you need to look out for it. But 30, the thir anything in the 30 is always big. And then we always talk about closing sets and matches out. I touched on closeout sequences. We make all of our juniors, I make my more competitive adults have closeout sequences. You can do this in doubles and singles. We give them three shots in their pattern. We don't say forehand or backhand. So for example, we teach, I'll serve out, I want to serve out wide. I'm going to hit to the open court because my opponent's off this way, and then I'll hit to the open court and come in and put away the volley. Large target areas, I'm not gonna stipulate which side I'm gonna get because we don't know, but I'm gonna have a target area. The big key is when you're teaching your lessons this, is you want the opponent to move. So whatever your sequence needs to be, you just want them moving. So in other words, I need them to move one direction and then make them change directions. So a lot of times we'd like to do serve up the T, you hit back behind the person, because when you serve with a tee, they're moving to the middle of the court, and you hit back behind, they have to stop and change directions. Things like that are very, very effective, okay? And they're easy for your lessons and clients to get and understand, okay? Worst case scenario, give them just one point, okay? Give them one point. When you get to this point, just run it, okay? And then get them to do it in their, in their lessons, okay? A lot of times I like to finish with 10 minutes at the end just with that pattern, okay? Instead of doing a game, instead of... Run the pattern over and over again. Serve it, I'll feed it. Serve it, I'll hit it. Whatever it is, let them run that pattern so they can see it in their sleep. Okay? All right, I always have that, that going. Okay? So those are the big, big ones. Okay? If they get real technical, a lot of times I like to work with my elite players. Okay? I have a young lady that's on the tour now. I will have her actually run her closeout sequence as her opening game sequence. Her closeout game will be her first game of the match. And we do that as a tester, okay? First game is usually our opponents are tentative. They're gonna play a little bit just to kind of get a feel what's going on, okay? So I'll, I'll actually have her run that then, let her see how her opponent reacts, and then she'll be able to be prepared when it comes time to close out. She'll have a good understanding of what she's looking at. So those are very effective things, opening, closing games. Get on the board, and then obviously finish the match, okay? We talk about the other way that points can shift, okay, is we talk about when you win three points in a row. At that point, momentum has shifted, okay, from one of these five stages. So you have score counts, specifically, and then you have the three point swing, okay. This is very, very big, all right. People don't see this because sometimes we play no, if we play add, you go to deuce, you win two points, then you win the next point. That's actually a momentum shift. People miss that one a lot. 
any time they win three points in a row, the momentum is shifted. Okay? And so you want to teach your, teach your players this. Okay? Don't totally emphasize it. Don't go out and say, because they'll be paranoid. All right? But if they win two points or lose two points, they need to understand that they need to probably slow, slow down the momentum, the tempo of the match, or keep it going. Okay? I've seen matches numerous times where players have had big leads. Okay, then they opt out, and then they have to they take a bathroom break, or they get an injury timeout. Okay, that drives me nuts. Okay, you've just you've just handed the momentum back to your opponent, or at least worst case, you've at least neutralized that momentum. Okay, all right. So you've got to really watch that with your players. It's a three point swing, and it happens all the time. When we have our kids chart all the time, we get them to count it up, and I promise you, 90 percent of the time. When we did our study, 90% of the time, the person that won the most, the most three-point swings in a match, because it happens often, won the match. Okay. So again, momentum plays a major role in this, and that's the things that we look for Okay, all the time. All right. When we talk about, especially in three-point swings or these critical points, what we, tell, what we want to tell our, our lessons are you run a very good game plan that you can help them with, but more importantly, they control the tempo of the point, even returning. We want them to go back to the back curtain and then come back up to the net, or excuse me, back up to the baseline with a very deliberate plan, okay? We want them to know exactly what they're going to do. My return's gonna go here. We may not be able to control the serve. That's okay. We want them to serve, to return to a certain area, okay? These things allow them to be comfortable in these situations, okay? It, it reduces a little bit of the choking. All right, all these things. So we give them a good game plan, Get them to control the clock a little bit, okay, and then they usually have a tendency to play these points much better. Then they're able to control the momentum much better. We talk about other things that we can work with that we've emphasized on these big points. One is body language, okay, so I'm kind of jumping around on this, but we now know the shifting points, the two ties, the three point swing, and then obviously critical score counts. Now we go into the, how we control one is body language. Okay, when we talk about body language, obviously very positive, bouncing around, okay, before the point starts, get a lot of energy going, cannot hurt, okay, it cannot hurt, your opponent sees the energy, okay, maybe that puts a little bit of pressure, but more often than not, it simply gets your lesson or your client ready to play, okay, they're ready to start the point, they're fired up to do it, okay, it's very, very big, I don't, a lot of you, if you teach juniors, for whatever reason, they don't like to do this. Okay, they think that they look a little bit geeky. All right, that's, that's the, what they tell us. They're like, yeah, you know what, that's not cool. I don't do that. I don't understand why. Okay, so we've kind of got more into it and talked to these kids. And the, the funny thing is they see the pros do it. They see the best players in the country do it. But the, for the players underneath, okay, they think that if they do it, they're trying too hard. That's what they said. Okay. They don't want to put that expectation on it. They want to look, they'd rather look cool than rather you know, do the right thing. No, I don't want everyone to think I'm trying too hard. Okay, which was very interesting on that. Okay. So after we hammer this out, they watch, they watch, they watch. Okay, this is a big part of it. Body language is a big part of it. If any of you've had uh, clients that go down or, or juniors that go down to voluntaries or any of the academies, this is the first thing they teach. Okay? It's the first thing they teach because they come back. Okay, they may have hit a million balls, all right, but what happens is it's usually their body language, the confidence, the way they carry themselves, all right, because that's ingrained from day one. They just pound on it, pound on it, pound on it. Okay, you will be positive, you will be fired up on these big points, you will carry yourself, okay, high, you'll have a good body posture, okay. These things matter, okay, and that's what they instill. And then what happens is they come back, they come back home, okay, and everyone's like, oh my goodness, look at, look at the changes. And it's really, I'm not knocking those pro places, I'm just saying what happens is, is that they get out there and we see this difference in the player and all they've really emphasized is the first one, which is body language. Carry yourself correctly, okay? Now, if I've hit millions of balls, I might have a little bit better body language too, but it's very, very important, okay? And I'll go back and emphasize the Brian twins. Every point, we know about the Brian bump, okay? These guys get sky high. They understand the points are limited. They understand the match is short. And again, they make their living off of this, okay? A 90-minute match for thousands and thousands of dollars, it's a big deal. So they get sky high, and they do it for every point, okay? 
Go back and tell your lessons. They're in the gym, okay? They practice two and a half hours before their match, and then they go in the gym for another hour before every match. They make sure that they are absolutely sky high for it, okay? So it's very important for them, okay? A lot of these pros, they're all doing this now. Very important with body language, okay? Unforced errors. We've got to reduce the unforced errors, okay, on this point. If you lose these big points, it's because your opponent hit the winner, or your, your player is trying to dictate the point, trying to do the pattern you set out for them. They served out wide, and they just miss it wide, trying to go the other way, okay? All right, they serve up the tee, and they end up hitting it right up the middle, and the opponent steps in and rips it. Okay, at least they're trying the right things. At least they're trying to create opportunities for themselves. They may not win it. We know a lot of times that's not going to happen, but at least that they're trying, and therefore they won't lose the momentum. Okay, all right. The, uh, the last one is tempo, and we've talked, I've talked about that one already. Okay, we've got to control the tempo. If you're winning, speed it up. Okay, I always hesitate telling people that because then they'll start playing super fast, right fast, right? But we just want them to, to take, keep the tempo going in their favor, okay? If their opponent's been handing them errors, then you want to keep them doing that, okay? Play at their speed, okay? They're the ones that are self-imploding, okay? Well, we'll just let you walk right out the door, okay? You just keep, we'll just keep going that way. Last thing you want to do is chalk their memory or get them to realize that they're playing and they're in the middle of a match. And you've all seen it where the persons you see, they're distracted, they're upset, they're frustrated. You want your player just to kind of keep feeding that, okay? Let them just walk right off the court, okay? All right, so won many matches that way. I did because the players I played were, I'm not very big, I'm not very strong. They were a lot bigger, they were a lot stronger, okay? But they weren't, I was willing to, to understand and, and use that momentum. And so when they were upset, I just let them stay upset the whole time. So, so it's very, very important um, on that. So we've talked about those three things. In the middle of the matches, okay, or games, because we've talked about points and momentum shifts, there, there are three very important games in the match. Sixth and seventh games in the second, first and second set or third set. So in each set, sixth and seventh games are the most important games of each set. And then most importantly, the most important game of the entire match, first game, second set, when we talk about momentum. A lot of some people know this, some people don't. Okay, first game, second set. The reasoning behind this is you've won the first set, you get up on the board early in the second set, your opponent is feeling the weight of the match, they're losing control of the match. Okay, a lot of times in USTA, okay, they start thinking about things that they have to do off the court, they start to get distracted, and you can see that that match just slides right out of control. Okay. All right, but we've got to understand usually the first game, second set is when the opponent, okay, gets fired up again. They're going to give it one last draw. They're going to give it everything they got this, okay? And you've heard your lessons all say that, like, well, you know, I was down 5-2. I didn't really want to come back in the first set. So I gave them that set, and then the first game, that next game, man, I got really fired up for it. I got really psyched for it. So you got to, you got to educate your lesson. This is when your opponent's going to probably play their best, but if you can jump on them, you can make it a competitive game. You don't have to necessarily win it, but if you can make it a competitive game, you can maintain momentum. If you can sweep the game, you can actually really get them to walk out the door. Now, our studies have shown that with the creation of the super tiebreaker, it's not quite as accurate as it used to be. When you had a third set, your opponent's sitting there going, well, I lost the first set. I'm down in the second set already. I gotta win this set after I lost the first set and I have to win a third set, it's not gonna happen, it's not in it for me today. Now with the creation of the super tiebreaker and that being a standard score, now what we're finding is, is that they're like, well, man, if I can just find a way to get the second set, it goes to super tiebreaker, who knows? Anything can happen, okay? It's very, so it's a little bit different. So what we try to educate our, our players on is first two games. First two games of the second set, you get up 2-0, they're likely to, to hand it over to you. Doesn't mean you ease off the gas, but it will make your life so much easier, okay? And that's what we try to explain to them is it's not necessarily when you win these games or these points, the match is over. But what you'll see is your opponent starts to get dejected, their execution goes down, and usually your execution goes up if you stay focused and stay on it, okay? So six and seven games, swing games, okay, happens all the time. If anybody's been watching any of the matches, player goes up 4-1, all of a sudden it's 6-4 the other way. 
They lose 4-2, 4-3, six and seven games, completely changes, okay? All right, you can watch these players. They dial in on these score counts, okay? Early in matches, they may be working up, okay? Working up into the match, okay? Then they hit around the sixth, seventh mark, and you can see them really dial in on the returns. They don't make unforced errors. The points are better, okay? It's not because they're warmed up, I promise you. It's not because, okay, well, now the player's warmed up used to the conditions. They've done it. I promise you, they've gone out, they've gone to the practice course, they, they do, you know, they're very, very particular about when they practice, where they practice, the courts, the lights, the balls. They will have hit many times before they get out there. It's just that they understand these are the bigger points, these are the bigger games. I'm going to really dial it in. I'm not going to make a silly error. I'm not going to do anything goofy. I'm really going to make sure that I, I play this point out aggressively and hard. So these are things that you can communicate to your lessons, your juniors, your adults, okay? Do it across the board. The next page behind it is a flowing chart example. And then the following one is actually one you can use. So if you're watching the matches today, you can use it. This is a, this is a fairly intricate chart. And I'm not gonna lie, I did not create this one, okay? The one I simply do with our juniors, I just get graph paper like this right here. I give them a clipboard and a pencil, okay? And what I have them do, okay, is I have them chart, and if they go up, if they win a point, they go up half a square. If they lose a point, they go down half a square. Okay, and what happens is you'll end up getting, all right, a flow of the match, okay? You'll actually, your opponent, or excuse me, your player, when they come off the court, you can hand it to them, and they'll instantly be able to see the momentum right off the bat. You don't have to make any notes. I make notes, I'll circle if I see a double fault or an ace, because I think those are big key things. You can add different information on the sides. What you want though, the main gist is, you're gonna see, okay, the flow of the match. And then what happens is you're able to circle, hey, did you see this point right here? At this point you won, and all of a sudden you see it skyrocket one direction, down or up, hopefully up, but sometimes down. So then you can go back and say, okay, let's talk about this point. This is the point that swung. Why did it happen? When did it happen? Okay, and that's how we know statistically these score counts are important. Because we've charted so many of these matches, and we've looked at it and we see, okay, this is where the matches are won and lost every time. Six and seven games, this score count right here, almost every time. Okay, so it's very, very important. And so I like to do this with a lot of times with the juniors, okay? And then what we'll do is we usually take a group of kids, I'll have them chart the matches for each other. So that when they're charting, they actually can understand it themselves. They can see it, okay? When they're writing it down, when they're doing it, it's very, very effective, okay? I like the other charts where you can chart winners and losers. That's a great, you know, how many errors, where they make it, okay? Again, that's good for statistics, all right? But nothing beats being able to chart the flow of a match. So I'd rather get the kids to chart the flow. It will educate them as they go, okay? And then at the same time, though, at the end of the match, you have something tangible to hand back and that you can go over, and then you can talk about the score counts. Why didn't you run your pattern here? What happened here? We talked about closeout sequence, okay? You had one chance, 6-5, okay? Why didn't you run it? All right, we just had a young girl that came back from, from a national event. She was up a set, 6-5, okay? And she didn't run her sequence. I had a coach there, he watched it, Okay, after the match, and so she lost the game, then lost the set, then lost the third set. Okay, that was her probably chance for the year. We said, why didn't you run? Because I just was too scared, which happens. Okay, but it's a teachable moment. Instead of saying, man, you know, gosh, that was a close one, it's competitive. We know exactly what happened. And then we're able to coach it and go straight into it. So in this case, she spent the next two weeks running that closeout pattern over and over again. Okay, to where she would get up and say, okay, yeah, it's in my brain. I, I dreamt of running that pattern. Okay, so we don't, you know, you don't know when it's going to arise. It's going to happen. But these are tools and techniques that are very, very effective. So, I'm done talking. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. What about uh, momentum shifting uh, points during the max tie break, especially, and uh, the regular tie break? There's definitely. Mm -hmm. In the super tiebreakers, we usually um, we usually coach them. It's the first three points of a tiebreaker and a super tiebreaker. 
Now, our statistics, which again are not ATP statistics, it's just from our matches, so they're more from the junior level, okay, from nationals to probably top 50 in the South kind of players. But from our statistics, it's saying the first three points, if you can win the first three points in a, in a tiebreaker, you've got over a 70% chance of winning that tiebreaker. If you win the first three points in a row. Okay, again, momentum's in your favor, you've got control, you're in, you, you can really run away with that. In a super tiebreaker, it's a little bit less, it's down in the 60s, it's about 68% that we say in a super tiebreaker. So, um, if that hopefully answers your question. The first three points are huge. Okay, and then what happens is they get to close it out, they get that one point, we want them to run their closeout sequence. So, for sure. Yes, sir. Sixth and seventh games, yes. Why is it uh, why is it important? Like, how, how for for momentum, it's a big swing game. A lot of and it's a lot of it is to do with perception from our opponent. There's a big difference between four three and five two. Okay, and obviously realistically it's five two. But it's a, you know if I'm up four one, okay, and then I sit down and it's four three, that player's now back in the middle of the match. If I'm up, if I go from four one to five two, which we we kind of expect, well then then I've got opportunities to close out. And obviously, if I win the set six one, it's actually a very very big game. I've, so, I've been told by growing up that the seven, you have to win the seventh game when you play. I didn't know why. Yeah. Why yeah. Seventh game, and we like to say the sixth game is just as important going into that. Um, on that. So we get them geared up for that two two game sequence because obviously at that point then they change it. <coughs> Yes, sir. Okay, so winning the first three points in the tie break will give you a 70% chance of winning that tie break. Mm -hmm. If you express that to a player, I'm not clear on how the player is supposed to interpret how he or she should be playing that point different or the same as, say, 15 all at the beginning of the match. I mean, what does the player do with that information? I mean, do they hope that the other person just doesn't <coughs> realize the importance of those points? Or do they do, is there some sort of practical element to this that they're going to play those points, those first three points differently than they would at some other random time in the match? It's a, it's a good question. Sometimes you get uh, TMI, too much information. If you throw that out there, then all of a sudden they win the first three points and they think they're done. We obviously don't want that. But what we do is we give them that information mostly because when people play tiebreakers in particular, they have a tendency to say, well, I've got seven points. So I can work my way into this tiebreaker. And that's the biggest mistake people make. You want them fired up and almost to the point where they're ready to close out the first point. And then what happens is you win those first two points. You have a lot of variety. You can run a lot of different patterns from there. Okay, then you can maybe try some off shots. Okay, but when you're tight, we talk about you're in that neutral stage, that doesn't give you a lot of flexibility to run different patterns to create a lot of variety. Okay, and we've just noted statistically that it's a 70% chance when they were in the first three points. The player feels more relaxed, whether it's because they, they mean to or not. They've got that cushion, so therefore that short inside-out forehand, when they're down 0-3, might be a little tentative. Now all of a sudden it's massive because they feel that, that weight lifted, so therefore their execution is just better because of that. Now what we want them to do is really the key is that they be very deliberate. That's what you want them to be. They can't always control the outcome. We just want them to have a set plan. Don't have them start the super tiebreaker, okay? If you get a chance to get that three minute window to talk to them, the last thing you wanna do is just say, well, let them go out and kind of play a couple of points and then see what's going on. You want it very deliberate, okay, and choreographed. And you say, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna try the best that we can. Get yourself fired up and let's jump on this person, so. But yeah, sometimes it can backfire. Again, we only can do what we can do, right? Anybody else? What is about a really big point where you, where it, if you're in an absolute positive, mm -hmm. uh, say, and then you have a really big point that you make below mm -hmm. that completely changes everything? Happens a lot. What causes that? What causes that? Yeah, why, 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 does that why does that cause completely change and, 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 and swing? Yeah. Two things usually happen with that, and it's with one is which the psyche of your opponent. All of a sudden, they, you give them hope. That's probably the biggest thing you've got to watch. You don't want your opponent to have hope they can win the match. On big points, when, especially if you do something that's very uh, like a double fault or, or a, a mishit forehand wild, okay, um, 
where you didn't get a chance to construct the point, you give the opponent hope like, hey, I may be able to win this match. Okay, I know the score says something differently, but I might be able to win this. So that's the first thing. And then the flip side of that is now all of a sudden your, your player might start to hesitate. They might, you know, we say open their eyes. They might start going, oh my goodness, what a, I, I'm winning this match. And sometimes if someone there's, they don't know if they're supposed to beat, they start to panic. They're starting to go, oh, I, I don't know what's going on. I, I mean, I was just kind of playing. Now all of a sudden the score kind of hits them in the face. And they're going, I could lose this. And you see that. You can see that kind of like that look like, holy cow, wait a second. Uh, I don't know if I should have been there. So those two things happen on those big score counts. It's just kind of a wake-up call on either end. And so you don't know. Sometimes it can kind of settle back down. Sometimes that player is still so frustrated they don't, you know, they don't get back into it. Okay? But more often than not, especially when it's especially at the elite level, when the difference isn't a total blowout, it's pretty close. You can see them going. Hang on, there's a chance. Okay, if anybody saw Hewitt last night against Russell, um, Hewitt was hurt. Hewitt's hurt. I mean, he's got a bad back. Okay, and Russell went to serve out the match. Okay, and it was the worst game he could have played. He'll tell you that. I'm not telling you something different. Okay, he threw in a double fault to lose the game. Okay, all of a sudden you can see Hewitt played the next couple of games much, much better. You could see him feel like he had a chance. Now, Russell ended up responding, playing even better, but he sure made his life harder. Hewitt's about ready to walk out the door. Russell serving. Guess what? Played a very bad, bad first point of the game, and then obviously finished the game off very poorly. Gave Hewitt hope. Hewitt's level came up at least two notches. Okay? Russell had to raise it three notches. He did, okay, but he shouldn't have had to. And he understands that too. It's not like he doesn't. He's a journeyman. He knows that. But again, <laughs> You know, if you have some lessons, they may not be able to do that. They may have already hit their peak. If he had done that with uh, a Hewitt that's healthy, or maybe if he'd done that against a Federer, that was his chance right there. That was all he's ever going to get. Okay, and, and you know, Federer was down two levels, plays too much, two levels better. Match over. There was his opportunity. So that that can happen. Yes, I got sir. a comment. Uh, might be interesting. Um, uh, you know, one of the things I I still just my competitive juniors is like. Is that uh, when they're winning a match, say they won the first set six three or something like that, and then they have a one game lead or two game lead in the second set, and suddenly they're playing this extremely close game when it's they go to dues and add in and dues. That's a momentum shifting right there, and they realize that they're in a moment where they might end up losing the match if they lose that game. I think that really gets them a little bit more aware of the situation. I don't know. Yeah, it, it certainly does. And then that, again, that's where you kind of have to pick and choose which ones. That's where that three-point swing can yeah. take effect. That's where the sixth and seventh game can take effect. There's no guarantees. These, all you're doing is just educating that these are opportunities and you need to stay up, keep them on their toes. And that's why, especially with Jews, you hear them say, well, they have a tendency to get bored with a match. You should never get bored with a tennis match because anything can change. And if you're always on the lookout, one of these scenarios, either critical score counts, three-point swing, six and seven game, first game, second set, it's all, they're always constantly going on throughout the match. And any of those things can change the course of a match. So it really keeps them on their toes. It's also very mentally draining. Okay, so if you get your players first off to try to understand that, it's very, very mentally draining. Okay, but that really is the key. Is you never let up. You never let this momentum slide. You control it from start to finish, okay? And then that allow your players to, without hitting an extra ball, maybe even beat people they shouldn't beat because they understood and they took advantage of it throughout the course. <coughs> yes? I think you've been involved with the, in coaching in college. What effect can a coach have on momentum? Uh, being allowed to coach, being able to say coaching. Tremendous. Uh, just, uh, Tremendous. The coaches that understand this, and can feel it are the ones that their teams are consistently the best in the country. You've got some schools that go up and down, okay, and that's, in my opinion, that's got to do with just the recruiting. They've got some good players one year, the next year they don't. Good coaches that stay up in the top tiers understand momentum, they've got a player with talent, and they're able to harness that consistently. They're always, you know, you can, you can see them run out there, try to control it, slow it down, calm it down. Okay, they understand their players, which ones kind of don't control, which ones are automatic, and they, they, they kind of feel that and they, they, uh, they do that well. 
So yeah, it's, it's a big deal. Now this new format is very interesting. Does everyone know about the new college format? That's unreal. So uh, it's uh, doubles is no longer a pro set. It's first to six games. And then at five all, it's a tiebreaker. This is for the men's. Women's is different again. Five all is tiebreaker instead of six all. I think, it, I think it goes away in the next week or two. They're, they're, and then they, well, they want to bring so it back to the right next Right now, games. the indoor, they're playing out the third set. They're yep. playing the tiebreaker. Yeah. And some of the coaches can choose not to do it. They still. can, yeah. They but can. that's what they're going to shift to. And again, it's you know, more about TV time. But that's that would probably rework a lot of the strategy. Okay? Especially, you know, opening your opening game sequence might have to be your closing game sequence because you can't afford to get broken in doubles especially because you, you don't have time to come back. You see with the WTA, I thought it would take off more than it would. I think it creates better value in matches. Okay, we still see matches where they're blowouts. And I think coaching could stop some of that make the matches much more entertaining for everyone to watch because a coach can come out and calm the player down. We've all seen it where that player gets carried away. It would be nice. Uh, but no, not anytime soon. You know, talking about coaching, especially in the juniors, um, I think it's a great idea allowing coaching is definitely raising the level of the caliber of tennis out there. But uh, one of my thinkings is uh, that a lot of the juniors out there travel without coaches. Mm -hmm. And at the college level, everybody has a great coach. And I think it's unfair. I think it's a bad rule. Yeah, that's, that's why they, they don't do it in juniors. So well, the 10-point tiebreak, you go walk in there, and the other guy's talking to his best friend, and you're talking to your student. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm not going to say that every time I've, I've had a situation where my player has won. Mm -hmm. Sometimes he's lost, you know. Yeah. And uh, you got to tip my hat to the opponent, you know. But uh, I'd say probably better than 70% of the time, if I can have a situation like that, my player's going to win the match. Yeah. And that's just unfair to the kid, you know, and I think that's a bad rule. Yeah. I'll bring up the junior comment. <laughs> but yeah, it's... um. Yeah, we, we have a policy here. I don't know when two of our players play each other. We don't coach during the yeah, match. Yeah, same year. We won't, we won't do we that. Do the same thing. And we've had a few situations at like nationals where they're playing and we just have to sit there and we've had a few interesting conversations. But like you said, it's it's not really fair. So we don't do it. Is that it? Other questions? Great. Well, you all have a great day. Thank you. Enjoy the tennis.